512 CUDA cores, 1.5GB of video memory, and a power draw well over 200 watts. At the time, the GTX 580 was king of the hill when it came to the fastest single GPU that you could put in your gaming rig, and I'm wondering how well this GPU has aged since. With new game releases such as Red Dead Redemption 2 and the new Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, can the fastest GPU from 2010 keep up today at all? What's also interesting to look at is that if you take the amount of money that you would have spent on a GTX 580 back in 2010, you know, this is a flagship GPU, it's not cheap by any means, and you spend that in today's market, well, the first thing is you're no longer getting a flagship GPU, but you are at least getting a very different looking piece of hardware and a very different gaming experience as well. So whether this is a bit of nostalgia for you, perhaps you used to have a GTX 580 in your gaming rig, or maybe you just want to see how this old GPU performs in modern titles. Either way, this is a pretty interesting look back at Nvidia's GTX 580. Now I'll be the first to say that this GPU was, as they say, before my time. When this GPU launched back in 2010, I was barely a couple years away from finishing high school and was purely a console gamer at the time, so I definitely don't claim to hold any sentimental value with this GPU. Having said that, this makes it even more interesting for me personally, seeing as I don't really know what to expect from the fastest GPU of 2010. And this look back isn't to see whether the GTX 580 is worth buying used today or anything like that because it absolutely isn't and I also believe that most gamers who bought this flagship GPU that long ago have definitely upgraded since. This is more to see how far computer graphics processing has advanced in roughly 10 years and whether the GTX 580 can keep up at all with modern titles of today with respectable settings. Before that though let's take a look at what we're working with in terms of specs. So the GTX 580 is running the Fermi 2.0 microarchitecture using TSMC's 40 nanometer process and packed 512 CUDA cores. The GF110 GPU packed 3 billion transistors into the 520mm squared die, and while that sounds like a lot, that's just 16% of the transistor count of an RTX 2080 Ti. For the most part, the GTX 580 shipped with 1.5GB of GDDR5 video memory, but the one I have on hand is a rare 3GB version. TDP is 244 watts, and that's a ton of cooling requirement for just a two-slot single fan blower cooler. The PCI Express interface here was just 2.0 x16, and we would see 3.0 x16 on the next generation of cards. So 40 nanometers, that sounds pretty ancient by today's standards. For reference, TSMC now produce 7 nanometer silicon used by current gen AMD hardware, and 5 nanometer production isn't too far away. This spec reflects in memory capacity and density as well. It's hard to think that just 1.5 gigabytes of VRAM was considered flagship, even in 2010. For a bit of reference, each memory module that you see here on our 3 gigabyte card contains only 250 megabytes megabytes per memory chip. And so 500 US dollars is what the GTX 580 launched at. That would give you the purchasing power of around $590 today in 2020. That could get you one of the most premium RTX 2070 supermodels with some change to spare, or an RX 5700 XT with a handful of decent games. I think we can all agree that at least design-wise, we've definitely come a long way. Even paying a hefty $500 for a graphics card in 2010, backplates were only reserved for the very top top tier models, and the majority of cooler designs back then were single fan, vapor chamber, blower style coolers. RGB illumination was pretty much non-existent, and you're definitely not going to find any anodized aluminium or mirror finish on a graphics card from 2010. It was all about plastic and cool graphics. For rear I.O. we're working with two DVI and a single mini HDMI port, a far cry from the stacked display port, HDMI and even USB Type-C that you'll find on today's graphics cards. Another thing that you won't find on the GTX 580 is support for the Vulkan API. This GPU just does not have the ability to run it. Some modern titles are optimized solely around Vulkan as opposed to DirectX 11 or 12, especially a lot of graphically intense single player titles. This means that if you are desperate to play those games on a GTX 580 for whatever circumstance, you will have to choose an alternate API choice, which is usually DX12. But the problem there is that the GTX 580 
community also has limited support for DX12. Plain and simple, there are a few modern titles today which just simply refuse to run at all on this GPU. Still though, DX11 is by far the most popular API choice for modern games, but that is slowly changing as time goes on. I'm also not sure whether the card that I've got here has been repasted at all during those nine and a bit years because thermals here were absolutely atrocious. As expected, the thermal paste had pretty much dried up and cured up to a solid. We might repaste this in another video. So how well has the GTX 580 aged since 2010? I mean, how much more demanding really are the games of today compared to back then? Well, apparently they're a lot more demanding. Now granted, we are running these games at maxed out settings, in some cases dropped one notch, because quite frankly, even the budget GPUs of today can handle these titles no issue. We will take a look at lower quality settings afterwards, but the GTX 580 is getting absolutely tortured here. Rainbow Six Siege, for example, which is a fairly easy title to run, even on the $169 GTX 1650 Super, which can run this game maxed out at over 113 FPS on average, but the flagship GPU of 2010 can only manage a little over 35 FPS. And this performance continues, I mean it really is a bloodbath for what used to be one of the most sought after GPUs, and that's simply because games have become a lot more demanding to run as GPU performance has progressed. Take Red Dead Redemption 2 for example, a title optimized around the Vulkan API but does still run DX12 on the GTX 580, but run is definitely a relative term. It was definitely more of a slideshow with intermittent pacing and stuttering. It's important to note that game developers are always ready to make their games more graphically intensive, adding a higher polygon count and extra detail, fog and lighting for example. It's the GPU processing power that is always playing catch up, not the other way around. Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order is another very popular title that looks pretty amazing from a graphics point of view. And while the GTX 580 can definitely run this game at lower settings, we'll take a look at that in just a minute, game graphics have progressed too far for this GPU to run confidently. Esports titles of course will run fine though. In Overwatch we managed a touch over 60 FPS on average with one notch down from max settings. But when you compare that performance to what you could get today if you spent a similar amount of money, here it's a little over 400% of GTX 580 performance, but in most titles we've looked at, the performance margin is well over 600%. Those performance margins are even more impressive when you consider that the power consumption is roughly equal to what the GTX 580 was pulling. That sort of power draw really puts into perspective how impressive GPUs of today are from an efficiency standpoint. It's also interesting that we're operating at a similar power draw for a similar amount of money, even 9, 10 years on. That's one thing that hasn't changed much. So with lowered settings, can the GTX 580 play the demanding modern titles of today at all? Well, dropping the settings down to minimum in Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order did bump our 24 FPS average up to around 33 to 40 FPS, and that was technically playable for a single player title. And honestly, the game still looks pretty impressive with atmospheric lighting effects and relatively far draw distances. Still though, you will get well over double this frame rate with a budget GTX 1650 Super for some perspective. The point is though, the GTX 580 hasn't completely kicked the bucket yet, but it is definitely bordering that edge. Even with completely minimum settings in Apex Legends, there were times that I was dropping below 30 FPS in intense gunfights which contained a ton of visual effects, especially in open areas of the map. I feel like this clearly answers whether this GPU can in fact keep up at all with modern titles. So how does the fastest GPU of 2010 perform today? Probably as well as some of you would have expected. Moore's Law has progressed accordingly to plan during that time period and technology does move incredibly fast. Another sort of mind boggling thing to think about is how the $500 GPUs of today will essentially be paperweights by the year 2030 if we're going off the same sort of performance and time period. Not only that, but how much more demanding those games will be to play and what they could even look like from a graphics point of view. As always guys, a huge thanks for watching. Consider subscribing down below if you haven't already, and I will see you all in the next one.